Welcome to another collection of Game Boy games from 1990. Picking straight up where the last video left off, in this episode we're going to be taking a look at every game released from around April 20th to the end of July 1990. There's some brilliant stuff to check out, from Gargoyle's Quest and Double Dragon to Cosmo Tank and Barai Fighter Deluxe. Let's get on with it. We loved a bit of the old ninja style back in the day. So much so that the western release of a game called Super Chinese Land had ninjas plastered into it, despite the fact that ninjas are actually from Japan. Super Chinese Land sounds like one of the worst names for a takeaway imaginable, and Ninja Boy isn't exactly inspired either. This is actually a port of Kung Fu Heroes, a kind of obscure NES game from 1986. It's an overhead action game where you're a large-headed boy fighting his way through eight levels of four stages each. Each stage has four screens in a square grid, and the aim is to kill a certain number of enemies per stage, which causes the exit to start flashing and beeping obnoxiously. There are lots of different weapons, but many don't work on all the enemies, which becomes rather frustrating, as you can imagine. At first, I wasn't aware that you can cycle through the weapons you've collected. You hold A and B, and then tap up and down. Select was too complicated, I guess. It's maddening to be trying to select the right weapon to use on a particular enemy using a ridiculous control scheme that doesn't always work, only to have that enemy brush up against you and kill you instantly. Would a health meter have been too much to ask for? The weapon select is not the worst thing about the controls, though. Ninja Boy suffers from my biggest pet hate for a simple two-button video game. The jump and attack buttons are the wrong way round. I know I'm being harsh, but I can't make allowances for any game that gets this wrong. There's no excuse for it. What makes Culture Brain think Ninja Boy is so special that he got it right, where so many more famous mascots, Mario, Sonic, Simon Belmont, the guys from Contra, got it wrong? Speaking of famous mascots, Ryu? That name's been requisitioned by a superior fighter, I'm afraid. Not only do the characters have massive heads, but the player's sprite also has a massive fist. Not exactly discreet for a ninja, but I suppose it's necessary if you're going to be punching lots of things. The jumping uses a weird pseudo 3D perspective, which is really hard to judge. The music is a mixture of cliched Chinese style music and 8 bar blues, because why not? There were actually two sequels to this game. Thankfully, only one of them came out in English, and it's totally different, so we'll forget about this one until then, and go again. Usually, when a game is suffixed with a number 2, it stands to reason that there was a number 1 that came before it. When I was a lad, it puzzled my friends and I just where the hell Street Fighter 1 was. It materialised that there indeed was a first one, but it was so tragically bad that we as a society just refused to acknowledge it. To that end, we have Popeye on the Game Boy. You may be thinking, I own this game, what are you talking about? Well, no, you don't. I implore you to go take a closer look at the cartridge. You'll more than likely see that it actually says Popeye 2. This one is a Japanese exclusive that until quite recently I was not aware of, and it dawned on me that I never questioned where it was, having owned the sequel for so many years. Anyway, this is nothing like the one you've played. It's a top-down maze game, and it makes absolutely no sense. It's not a single screen maze, the level scrolls around to an approximately 3x3 three three sized grid. So you're moving around, the character isn't snapped to a grid so your movement actually has to be really precise, else you'll find yourself caught up on the corners of the maze. The aim is to chase down and pick up olive oil and carry her to the baby Sweepy. To make Sweepy appear, you need to collect hearts. 
Bluto is also running around, but he doesn't kill you or anything. If the two of you come into contact with each other, you just need to fight him, i.e. press the B button until your thumb falls off. There's no game mechanic here. It doesn't matter whether or not you win, it just takes up a load of your time. So you're best off avoiding Bluto altogether. Upon fisticuffs breaking out, Olive will run off and you'll have to track her down again. Wimpy is also present in the maze. He drops hamburgers which impede both you and Bluto. Sometimes he'll eat them as well. I really don't know what's going on in any aspect of this game. Spinach is collectible, but it doesn't make you stronger in the fights. No, Popeye needs spinach in order to be able to lift a burger. These are apparently quarter-ton burgers. Give a burger to Wimpy, the guy who dropped it in the first place, which you need to do to make the baby appear. I have many questions about Popeye. Why is Bluto no actual threats to Popeye, and why doesn't he go after Olive like he does in practically every episode of the cartoon? The graphics are proportionally all over the place. The sprites, though nicely drawn and representative of the characters, are three times the height of the trees. I do like the interstitial pictures that pop up. They look really good. The music is actually not bad. The well-known theme song is there with an accompanying jaunty and lively soundtrack. This is all well and good, but I just wish I knew what the hell is going on in the game. It's not the objectives themselves. You collect the thing in order to collect the other thing that makes the third thing appear, which you then collect. This makes the fourth thing appear, which you can collect and take to the fifth thing. Simple enough, right? What bothers me is that I have no gosh darn clue what any of it means. The cartoon was weird. This game is really, really weird. It's always cool to see an unknown game developer produce a unique game. Quite often it's these smaller companies that give us the most non-formulaic titles. Meldak were a jazz music production company who, in the late 80s and early 90s, made a handful of games for Nintendo consoles. Heiankyo Alien was their first Game Boy attempt, and they also put out the incredibly expensive, and frankly mental, Zombie Nation on the NES. Common to all their titles, though, is a strongly traditional Japanese theme, something that was often toned down for Western markets. Mercenary Force definitely shines in this area. You control a, well, a force of mercenaries. Four, to be precise. Your party march forward in a horizontal, auto-scrolling style, blasting the life out of anything and everything that approaches them. You move all four characters in tandem, but what is rather cool is the ability to rotate between four different formations as you play, by hitting the B button. These formations are named after the elements, sun, wind, and so on. Depending on the situation, different arrangements benefit you, and it's a case of practice to figure out which is which. Some align your gang in a column, making you tougher to hit, but only giving a narrow spread of bullets. One arranges them in an advancing wall, obviously a huge target, but massive attack power. At the start of the game, you're given a budget and you need to hire your squadron from five different classes. Servant, Monk, Ninja, Samurai and Priestess. These have varying prices based on their abilities. The Priestess fires up and down vertically and the Monk fires at 45 degree angles. Choosing the right team, and in the right order, becomes vital to your success, especially later on when you're grossly outnumbered and accosted from all sides. They all have varying health too. You can switch the order in battle using select. Your party status is shown at the bottom. The character on the right of the list will be at the front of your formation, so it's useful to have a character with forward-facing shots and higher health. These can then be backed up with more spread fire from behind. As well as that, each character has a unique suicide ability that you can use if in dire straits. 
Pressing B will transform your party into an invulnerable demigod for a short while, based on the character at the farthest right of your party, allowing you to progress injury-free. However, once the period ends, that character will be gone for good, so it's best to activate it when they're down to low health. Each character has individual health, shown on the bottom of the screen, and do not respawn when you die. You're left needing to hire someone else, or left depleted. When shooting an enemy, coins are dropped, which you need to collect to repair your team members or hire new ones. It doesn't hang about for long though, meaning you often need to rush forward into oncoming danger to collect it. It's possible to gamble some of your cash for high reward, but I tend not to as money is tight and the odds are seemingly slim. The pace is slow, yes, but non-stop, and there are plenty of waves of enemies to occupy you. Mercenary Force is hardcore action from start to finish, the operative syllable there being hard, and oh boy is it hard. There are only six stages, and to be honest, it takes less than half an hour to scroll through them all, but you're gonna have to really figure out the best squads and formations to get through these levels. The first one is damn tough as it is, and you won't beat it easily. The opposition is varied and increasingly dangerous, and the bosses are very cool, including a very memorable multi-segmented dragon at the end of stage one. The game looks cracking, the sprites are just the right size, and thankfully, the Japanese aesthetic was not westernized at all, as was the case in so many early 90s titles. The music fits the theme of the game too, if unremarkably, but it's not unpleasant or jarring in any way. There is quite a lot of flicker, as is to be expected with so much going on, but the draw priority always lies with enemy bullets and your own team, which is definitely the fairest way to do it, meaning you're less prone to cheap deaths. So, as you can see, there are many different playstyles and tactics to adopt, and a lot of intricacies to figure out, more so than any other shoot-em-up I've played. And that's another thing I really like. Mercenary Force is definitely a shoot-em-up, it can't really fit into any other genre. You're scrolling horizontally, shooting swarms of enemies coming at you, but there are no fighter planes or spaceships in sight. Fantastic game, but one that is brutal in that way that old school Nintendo games so often were. It's not just hard, it's Nintendo hard. Back in our day, kids, games didn't hold your hand. They tore it off and slapped you with it, and we loved it. Nineteen ninety was a brilliant year for English football. We were in the midst of yet another golden generation of world-class players. Gascoigne, Lineker, Barnes, Butcher, Robson. Amazing. Okay, it was a golden generation that was so crowned before they'd even won anything, as it usually is with the stupidly high expectation levels of English football fans. However, we did get to the semi-finals of the World Cup, which is something we've barely come close to since. I admit, I may be overly keen to talk about the one sport I actually know anything about, but hey, I'm English, can you blame me? Let's have a look at the first soccer game. I'm using that term purely for separation purposes between real football and American football, but that's another topic. Except that, if you're an English person in 1990, you couldn't, because we didn't get this game here. So you go to the main game, I say main game, there's only one game mode. You can play a single match, no tournament, no league, nothing. Well, alright, if the mechanics and gameplay are alright, then we can overlook that. You next see the team selection screen. There are only six nations to choose from, one of which is GBR. Look, Great Britain do not have a football team outside of the Olympics. Great Britain is made up of several teams, all of which detest one another. This was especially true in the 90s at the height of the troubles in Northern Ireland and the like. Well, alright, perhaps Japanese developers didn't have consultants that would inform them of this little subtlety. Never mind, I'll pick GBR anyway. Oh wait, you're saying I have to be the USA? 
Um, well, alright, it's probably just a superficial difference anyway. So, to the game, I'd like to turn the music off because we all know that music blasting out at a football game is only for teams that don't have any actual crowd noise. You can't turn it off. Well, alright, I'll just turn the volume off. The sound effects probably aren't that good anyway. As you can tell, I'm trying to give this game a lot of leeway, but we haven't even kicked off yet and it's already 4-0 down. You get given the kickoff, but I've yet to actually manage to pass the ball to a teammate from one. You supposedly press A to pass, but your players kick the ball as would a two-year-old who's just starting to run. There's no auto-target either, you need to press A, or maybe B, who knows, to select the closest of your players to the ball, so don't expect to be able to do something as fundamental as, you know, pass the ball around. B makes your player fall over. I think it's supposed to be a slide tackle, but they just fall over and stay that way for about 20 seconds. Think Richarlison. Your goalkeeper is controlled by your movement inputs, which is fine to a point, except when the opponent toddles inexplicably past your last defender, who is probably lying on his back with his legs in the air. The goalkeeper is somewhere down near the corner flag. I think there's an opposition goalkeeper in the game, but that's merely supposition. I've never seen the guy. There's so much, so gosh darn much wrong with this game, but I have limited page space. I'll just give a handful more dishonorable mentions of aspects that upset me. The timer counts down from 45 instead of up from zero. Have the developers never seen a televised football match? The halves last like 10 minutes, which is too long even for a good football video game. The referee looks like Elvis. The little crosses on the pitch, I don't even know what they're supposed to represent. The goal and the lines on the pitch are in the wrong proportions to each other. The center circle isn't circular. Everything about how the game looks, sounds, and plays. The box art. The title of the game. The fact it's published by Sony, a company with a reputation for putting out solid video game titles. It's a good job this wasn't released in Europe, because we know soccer and this is anything but. It wasn't that yellow card at Italia 90 that made Gaza cry. It was this. You know when Lineker... Well... This is worse than that. Soccer Mania is so many different levels of abysmal that it has the power to turn people's bowels. From the makers of Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle comes another beloved cartoon character gracing a game completely unrelated to the show. Slapping a well-known mascot onto an otherwise unremarkable video game was something of an epidemic throughout the 90s. The Game Boy Color library is thoroughly plagued by this, and Kemco enjoyed their fair share. Snoopy Magic Show is a single-screen maze game where you control Snoopy and need to collect all of the Woodstocks, of whom there are usually four. Of course, you're not alone in these arenas. There is a bouncy ball that sort of tracks you around the maze, and obviously contact means failure. I say it sort of tracks you, I can't quite make out if indeed there is AI, but the ball's movement doesn't quite seem to be random. Certain blocks can be moved, and some can be destroyed. You know how this works by now. There are certain tiles that force Snoopy to move in a certain direction, akin to Team Rocket's HQ in the Pokemon games. I really like how the timer scrolls around the edges of the screen, taking up no more than three or four pixels. That's a clever idea as it allows the field of play to take up the majority of the screen. This only makes it more disappointing that the graphics are nothing special. It's obvious what's what and who's who, but more effort was needed in terms of the blocks and the backgrounds. 120 stages and a password save makes for a long game, but one that you don't have to sit through in one slog. The quicker levels are completed, the more points you get, and it seems that, early on at least, extra lives are thrown at you. And this is good because the game gets pretty tough. Some blocks are only there for a set time, disappearing and reappearing in a way that can leave you trapped in a small area with one of the evil balls. If that happens, it's basically over. You ain't avoiding that for long. There's a lot in Snoopy Magic Show that's not really explained. 
Spike starts coming after you for some reason. Why Woodstock is in trouble, or why there are so many of him, was not touched upon in game nor manual. I don't see any reference to a magic show anywhere, either. And where are the rest of the Peanuts gang? This was the only game on the Game Boy that any Peanuts character got outside of Japan. There is another Snoopy game much later on that I can virtually guarantee you've never heard of. And I'm a little sad that it's only alright. The real football had a shocking start on the Game Boy, but how did the other football fare? It's not my place to delve into the semantics of naming a sport where you barely kick a ball, football. I'm here to review a video game. Madden was still a way off yet, of course, but American football games were certainly around, and there were some good ones. Granted, they were more bad than good, but titles like Tecmo Bowl had the style figured out by the mid to late 80s. In NFL football, the horizontal orientation is swapped for a vertical one. There's little visually to see, the players are ant-like, and there's no crowd to speak of. This needs to be the case though. Soccer Mania showed us what happens when you zoom in too far on a Game Boy screen. At least here, the action can be seen. Surprisingly too, there's little flicker for the number of sprites on screen. Don't expect this to help you in any way though. The game is almost inaccessibly hard. I don't think my personal lack of knowledge is to blame here either. Some of Tecmo Bowl's successes were emulated here. At a break in the play, the offensive and defensive tactics you can use are varied enough. It'll take someone with more of a knowledge of football plays than a Brit who barely understands rugby, of course, and unlike Tecmo Bowl, there are no individual player or team stats present to make your tactic team selection combination anything other than arbitrary. I suppose it comes down to luck whether your touchline choices trump the opponent's one. There's no real guidance given here, you'd better know your plays because the manual doesn't even help. Anyway, select a tactic, and if you're defending, also a player. After the ball is restarted, you can't change the player you chose, so you better hope the offense plays the ball your way, else there's little you can do. The progress of the game is painfully slow. I'd be hard pressed to think of a slower one, actually. It's a good job each period has 15 minutes because it takes so long for any movement to play out. The music is pretty well done, which is to be expected from a Konami title. The sound isn't all good, however. If you remember the cartoonish whistling missile sound effect from Baseball, that's here too, and it ruins the only real achievement this game makes. Couple it with the lethargic pace at which the game plays, and you get an offensive, not in the football sense, 20 second long scream every time a ball is thrown. In brief, if there was ever a game that feels horrendously dated by today's standards, this could very well be it. Nobody could accuse the Game Boy of only being for little kids when Gargoyle's Quest hit the shelves. Some of the early games were simplistic and a little juvenile, but the first game in the Ghosts and Goblins spin-off series was anything but. If you've ever played the NES classic or the Master System title Ghouls and Ghosts, you'll perhaps remember a devilish red demon called Firebrand, a frightful little hellhound that antagonized Sir Arthur 
and made players everywhere throw their controllers around. It was safer in the 80s when they were plugged into the console. This time around, you're actually in control of Firebrand, tasked with saving the demon realm from evil King Bragel. If I were to tell you that this game is part RPG, you can pretty much guess the storyline. You walk around from town to town, fulfilling quests given to you by various barons and lords, fighting your way through castles and dungeons, killing a boss at the end. The RPG elements are not this game's strength, and honestly, they can feel a little tacked on at times. It serves well to drive the storyline, however, which I suppose was part of the motivation for featuring this. The main appeal of the game, as with all in this series, lies in the platforming sections. In good old Ghosts and Goblins style, you can take one hit, but then after that, you're dead. After the first couple of stages, you're presented with the Armor of the Dragon, which allows an extra hit, surprisingly accommodating for one of these notoriously hard games. You jump with A, and fire various projectiles with B. A lot of the progression is accomplished by clinging onto the walls, a la Batman on the NES, and you'll need to master this pretty quickly in order to pass. Press A again in mid-air, and you can hover for a short while, which is necessary to survive many of the platforming and combat elements. Later on, you can increase the flight time, which you inevitably need straight away in order to get across an otherwise unpassable chasm. You've played an RPG before, right? Both your flight time and armor can be upgraded more, and there are a couple of stronger attacks that you can learn too. The game starts you off with very little help, but is a little more forthcoming later on. In between the action levels, you walk around the overworld. The level of visual detail here is on a par with Link's Awakening or one of the Final Fantasy games. It's really quite striking to look at. And there's no exploration needed, it's a pretty linear path that you have to follow, walking from town to dungeon to town and so on. Random encounters will jump out on you periodically, but rather than having a turn-based battle, you enter a mini platform level where the goal is to kill the two or three enemies on screen. There isn't a massive variety of layouts here, you'll soon learn how to pass each one without too much trouble. Beat them and you obtain vials, which can be exchanged for extra lives. After each of these short interludes, your vitality restores itself, so grind as much as you want to get those vials. There's no levelling up, it's purely for farming extra lives. It's a little disappointing that more wasn't done with the RPG side of the game, it's one of those things that wouldn't be hugely missed if it weren't there. Some form of levelling up system other than here's a thing, you're now stronger, might have validated its presence a bit more. Some of the boss designs are excellent. A memorable early one features four gruesome looking eyes, called four eyes, amazingly, at stationary points in the corners of a spike-filled room. You need to destroy all four parts while avoiding their fire and hovering for just the right amount of time above the spikes and on a moving platform in order not to die. Of course, the level leading up to that boss is tough as nails and you can only take one hit at this point. Suffice to say, health pickups are few and far between. Die and guess what? You go back. Oh yeah, they weren't holding your hand. Don't be ashamed if you need to use save states to get anywhere with this game. It's as hard as they come on the Game Boy, but the payoff is worth it. One of the last bosses is a massive guy in a chair who sends invulnerable electric bolts after you. This took me such a long time to figure out and will test the patience of even the most astute players. The final boss is tough too, but by this point you have enough power-ups, you can now destroy the bolts to make it achievable with enough effort. The box art is classic late 80s cheese, with Firebrand represented in green. Apparently Nintendo were worried that a red demon as a playable character would be seen as too satanic. Jumping away from a toad with horns and Spongebob's friend Patrick. In game though, the visuals are astounding, with an amazing level of detail in the sprites and backgrounds. It looks as good as anything on the system so far and is only mildly spoiled by a bit of flicker and slowdown here and there. For the amount of action on screen, the developers did a great job of keeping this down. It could have been a lot worse. The music and sound is great as well. Suitably dark original music mixed in with some recognisable motifs cropping up from other games in the series. A lot of games like this suffered from over-recycled music, but there's just enough variety of tracks to keep Gargoyle's quest sounding interesting. And everything is well composed, using the sound hardware to its fullest capacity truly masterful game, both visually and audibly. It's a Ghosts and Goblins title, so have something soft nearby that you can hurl your Game Boy onto. 
take a deep breath, calm down, and remember, it's only a game, and you can beat it. It'll teach you the meaning of perseverance, if nothing else. Once again, Data East explored their vast arcade catalogue with a 1990 release of the 1981 response to Pac-Man, Lock and Chase. This is a maze game where you play a thief, called Thief, in a bank vault or repository of some sort, who needs to steal all the coins and any other treasures that sporadically appear, while avoiding the attention of a team of guards. Sound familiar? Well, a couple of gimmicks serve to set the title aside from Pac-Man. Thief doesn't continually move in a direction, let go of the directional button and your character stops. This actually feels nicer to me, but that's only a personal preference. There are teleportation doors that take you around some of the mazes, and you have the ability to create a blockade in some of the corridors, temporarily trapping the guards. Two of these doorways can be closed at any one time, which creates a quite distinct playstyle from that of Pac-Man. Coins are worth 10 points each, and in each level optional money bags and treasures appear, which are worth a lot more. Not only are the money bags worth points, though, they also temporarily halt the movements of the guards. Diamonds make you temporarily invincible and a bit faster, and allow you to punt the guards off the screen for more points. After every three levels, you can use any diamonds you've collected in a slot machine game to win points or extra lives. It's all about that high score. The premise of the game is basically that. The levels get more complex as you go on, and the blocking mechanic is an interesting addition to the genre. Sometimes guards will be asleep and can be activated or deactivated by stepping on a switch. The guards have different speeds and AI. Some seem faster than others, but the slower ones are slightly more devious. Learning when and when not to trap guards is a must. You always create a door between the two blocks that you most recently walked through, and if you're not careful, you can trap yourself. There's no way to reopen a door, they simply disappear after a set time. At first, the game may seem straightforward, but later on introduces the idea of auto doors and switches. On one level, the guards are all asleep, and you may wonder why you'd want to wake them, but in order to get past an auto door, you need to manipulate the guards to walk on a switch that you can't reach. There are secret passages to uncover later on as well. The thing that let Pac-Man down on the system was the horrible draw distance. Everything was too zoomed in and the game rendered way too hard due to not being able to see where the remaining pellets were. Lock and Chase learnt from this. You're still quite close to the maze, to the point where you can never see the entire level in one screen, but the coins are bigger and the characters smaller in comparison. You never notice a hindrance to your play due to the way the game looks, and there's a lovely fix for getting lost, whereby if you pause the game, you can move the view about to see where you need to head to. This is such a simple solution that it makes you wonder why Namco didn't see it. The game looks very good, actually, with some nice little cutscenes after each handful of levels. The music is chirpy and matches the cartoonish feel of the game. It's excellently composed, actually, with a lot of variation and some very nice sound effects. 18 levels in the first game beat them all and you get a whole new and much harder one to play. With a perfect difficulty curve, tons of charm and just enough innovation makes Lock and Chase an excellent addition to any collection, if you like simpler pick-up-and-play games. Also, where can you get a hat like that?
chill feeling struck my bones when I looked up the people responsible for heavyweight championship boxing. The same combination of developer and publisher that somehow managed to make beach volleyball unappealing in Malibu Beach Volleyball were at it again, this time attempting to create a punch-out experience for Game Boy. There were really only two ways to design a boxing game at this point, either a first-person affair like the aforementioned Punch-Out or George Foreman's KO Boxing, or a third-person one such as World Champ or Ring King. Admirably, Heavyweight Championship Boxing attempts to meld the two styles together. As the bout starts, you see the combatants jostling for position. Move close enough together and your viewpoint changes into an outline of your head behind two boxing gloves, which you can swing by pressing B and A for left and right punch. Your position is not fixed. Left and right on the D-pad allows you to move around. Pressing up while punching attempts an uppercut, and down focuses more on the body. Without a direction, hits a straight headshot. If you prefer to Floyd Mayweather your way through a fight, you can hold up or down without pressing A or B to block and defend without attacking. Balancing your attacks and your stamina is crucial to success, as laying into your opponent all guns blazing will lead you to punch yourself dry. It's possible to recover somewhat by moving away from the first person view and evading for a while. The strength of your attacks is determined by power meters with six grades in the bottom left corner of the screen. There's one for each hand, and when you throw a punch, that meter empties, taking a few seconds to recharge to the full six. You can throw another punch before it's full, but clearly this won't be as powerful. This is pretty innovative, and certainly I don't mind this idea. Where the mistake lies, though, is the window at which the meter remains full. If you don't unleash a blow straight away, the meter resets. I don't understand the motive behind this design choice. For a game that's clearly trying to emulate the sport at least somewhat realistically, having your strength overflow like this seems daft, and reduces the efficacy of a defensive tactic. The necessary timing to optimize your assaults while also positioning yourself and hoping the opponent doesn't block is way more arduous than it needs to be. There are several fighters to choose from, and it's possible to attribute skill points to them to a certain extent in order to customize your preferred strengths, whether you'd like to boost attack power, movement speed, or health. Each fighter has a dominant hand and preferred moves. It's possible in the fight, I'm not sure what triggers it, to perform a special punch. Occasionally, your gloves will flash, and if you can strike a full-powered punch with your dominant hand while they're flashing, the opponent will be knocked spark out, pretty much guaranteeing a victory. That's a lot of things that need to come together though, so don't expect this to be easy. In our journey to find a great fighting game on the Game Boy, we're sure to punch our way through some dross. This isn't terrible, it's a solid attempt at boxing with plenty of inspired ideas that slightly fall short in a few key areas. I must commend the fantastic music however, a real highlight on the platform up to this point. The sound effects are few and far between, but with such a high octane beat, do you need them? It's not bad to look at either, with the silhouette of your pugilist being easy to comprehend. I just wish they tidied the gameplay up more though. The inputs can feel pretty sluggish, and where heavyweight championship boxing falls short in comparison to a game like Punch-Out, is there's no real way to learn the game. Where the elegance in that title lay in figuring out the telegraphs of your opponents and what they meant in terms of weaknesses, they simply don't exist here, leaving you battling through what feels like a hit-and-hope slugfest. That's a real shame, because this game could have been the fighting game I'm looking for. We fight on.
The Sengoku area of Japan's history is an oft-travelled one in video games. The feudal period of the 15th and 16th century was largely dictated by decades of conflict between many warring clans, all striving for control of Japan. It was our old pal Nobunaga, as well as two others, who eventually managed to reunite the whole land under one central government. But not before bloody and costly warfare, propagated by daimyos and their samurai warlords. Allegedly, this game is based in this time period, but save from the samurai on the cover, you wouldn't necessarily know it. The title translates to Ayakashi's Castle, where Ayakashi are these mythical monsters that one might find on a long sea voyage. It appears the demon lord Doman has resurrected some of these monsters, and Nobunaga has tasked you, one person, to go and sort them out, so he can focus on reuniting the territories. There are five castles to crawl through, each named for a legendary beast of Japanese mythology. Each one features one or more floors of approximately 20 by 20 tiles each, starting easy but getting more complex. The aim in each stage is to collect the five pieces of the demon blade, needed to defeat Doman. I will say, I chickened out with this one as there is a lot of text to read, and the surface of the game was so intriguing that I downloaded a ROM hack which translates it into English. I'm sure the story isn't crucial, but nevertheless I wanted to experience the game properly, rather than through a dictionary. One of the first things you're told is to find a map. I strongly suggest making that an early priority any time you're in a new castle. These things are literally mazes, and while the view is clear, it doesn't take a lot to be thoroughly disoriented. Even when you find a map, refer to it a lot, because it doesn't allow you to view the entire floor at once and you can still get lost. As you stumble around these labyrinths, you'll be accosted by lots of random encounters, starting with things like bats and mice, which soon give way to zombies and ghosts. You can attack enemies, use arts, essentially magic, where all you have at first is a healing spell, or something called All Out, which I wouldn't use until you've leveled up a bit. Essentially, your character will just attack until either you or the enemies are dead. It's good if you're grinding, but if not, avoid. As well as the random battles, there are also certain scripted ones with more unique enemies. These are usually just after you open a door, or just in front of a treasure. You can traverse the dungeons smoothly, and the battles don't waste any time, which is great because this is the majority of the experience. The levelling up curve is well calculated. As you get stronger, the enemies become fewer and weaker, which lets you scour the castles much quicker. Entering a new castle presents you with a sharp difficulty spike, but as long as you've been thorough enough, it shouldn't be too much to overcome. Remember where the front door is as well, because at any point you can exit and replenish health and MP. This will also reset the scripted encounters. There are lots of apparent dead ends and rooms that seem not to lead anywhere. These typically have treasure chests in them, which can provide plenty of weapon or defense upgrades. Unfortunately, you can't see these chests even if you're on the tile next to them, they just sort of appear. A simple sprite showing a closed or open chest would help your navigation massively and stop you retracing your steps so much. Don't be put off too much by the initial difficulty. This is one you're going to need patience for. Save and backtrack regularly. It might feel repetitive at times, something not helped by the lack of variation in graphics and music. I wouldn't say the grind went overboard, though. Ayakashi no Shiro isn't really a game for a short 20 minute period. You'll undoubtedly need an hour at least to feel like you've made any progress. I haven't made it to the end yet, but I've reached Castle 3 and it took me a good 5 or 6 hours on and off. Not the best dungeon crawler or RPG by any means, but an entertaining point of interest for anyone looking for a real deep cut in the Game Boy library. Thank you.
The first Ultraman game out of the small handful that made it onto the Game Boy is a turn-based strategy title that I've had a really difficult time with. It feels a bit like a Fire Emblem title where you first have to place your Ultra Warriors down to defend certain areas. The goal is to find your enemy's base, which is hidden somewhere on your map. There's a Fog of War gimmick going on whereby everything is hidden unless there's a character on it. Each base has a guard stationed at it, and you win by reducing these guards' health to zero. You can then take over the base or carry on exploring. You may find things like special weapons or money and shops to spend it in. Let me explain why I struggled with Ultraman Club. It's not with the controls or difficulty. The music is fine, the graphics quite excellent, really. No, I struggled because of my own failings. I was defeated by the language barrier. Strategy games, RPGs, that sort of thing are understandably harder than most to get into if you can't read them. I've really stepped up my study of Japanese due to writing this book, but it's still subpar. Ultraman Club, as indicated by the title, is a spin-off series of Ultraman, the anime that we'll see again shortly. In this mini-series included a pretty decent Famicom RPG, released barely a month before this came out, but apart from the name and IP, there's really nothing similar between the two to give any clues. What this game does bear similarities to is another Japanese exclusive strategy game that we've recently explored, that being the first SD Gundam game. While this is not as car crashy as that one, it's still pretty awful. The strategy segments are non-existent, serving only as a vessel to get your warriors into combat situations with the enemy. And this is a big problem, because in a strategy game, it's pretty vital that you know which of your characters are attacking which of the enemy. What's the point in building up a unit as your strongest defense if you have no control over whom you target with it? The one-on-one -on -one battles are a turn-based affair where you use various moves akin to, dare I say it, a Pokemon game. Look, I'm being super generous there. Ultraman Club has nothing of the depth you'll find in that franchise. In fact, your moves appear to be totally randomized at the start of each fight. Some of them are attacks, some use items and so on but they change every battle, which is where my language barrier comes in. If the moves were standardized or could be customized somehow, I'd stand a chance of learning this. Instead, I have to translate the moves at the start of each battle, which is more exhausting than educational, or God forbid, fun. Perhaps I'm giving myself too hard a time with this language thing. Being totally analytical for a second, even if reading wasn't a problem, the design choices don't lend themselves to a game with any kind of nuance or intuition, or even a logical flow. All things you expect from a decent strategy game. The actions are far too randomized, which, while not unfair, is not exactly entertaining. Let's go back to Pokemon for a second. Imagine if you had no control over the members of your party, but they were random monsters from your PC, and when they were flung into battle, they had a bunch of moves that didn't complement each other or the Pokemon's type, or were even useful. Try beating the Dragon Master of the Elite Four with a Bell Sprout that only knows Lick for some reason, and you'll see my problem. What's the point of progressing through a game like this, leveling up your squad, learning the strengths and weaknesses, for it all to be bloody randomized anyway? You know what I'm fond of? A really gosh darn good puzzle game. That's a good job too, because I've chosen to write a book about the system that made the genre its own. Known as Pitman in Japan, although the protagonists are not both male, Cat Trap is a title originally developed for the Sharp MZ700. The Game Boy version is the only other version as far as my research tells me. You play as these really cute looking anthropomorphic cat boy and cat girl called 
well, cat boy and cat girl, who have been cursed and thrown into this labyrinth. They need to fight through all 100 levels to escape the maze and turn back to humans. The aim for each stage is to knock out all the ghostly creatures that stand statically in various hard-to-reach places. These don't move or hurt you, and you can only bash them from the side. Landing on top of them treats them as a platform. In your way are pits, they're cats that can't jump or climb, but whatever, and boulders that you need to use in a variety of ways to traverse the small screen. There are ladders and removable blocks that don't reappear once you make them crumble. Defeating the enemies is not the challenge, it's getting to them. That's notably all there is to the gameplay, except I really need to comment on a very interesting feature that I think is the first example of anywhere in video game history. At least, I can't find any earlier existence of this. It's fairly commonplace now, but in Catrap, it's possible by pressing B to rewind time if you make a mistake. This will happen time and again later on, and means you don't have to redo an entire large stage just because you accidentally knocked a boulder down or something. Anyone who's played Boxel or similar games will rejoice when they first use that feature. It's an excellent game device that's essential for keeping the player enthralled by this game, and it doesn't alleviate the difficulty much. That's another thing I should comment on. The difficulty curve over the 100 levels is absolutely spot on, with new mechanics being taught to you one at a time, and levels getting more and more challenging. I like that you can't die or get attacked, and the timer is just for your own best score, as it really allows you to sit and scratch your head to puzzle these stages out. The graphics are clear and big, and the animations are adorable at times. When you barge into a ghost, it feels very satisfying with a comic book style bomb that accompanies it. The movement of the cats when they hop onto and up the ladder is great. Something that could have been done in two frames of boring animation really had a lot of effort put into it. You can tell the artists were having fun with this one. There are stylistic differences between the two characters too. The boy kicks the boulders while the girl bashes them with her bum. They have different celebration animations too, each as endearing as the other. It would have been interesting to have the two characters play slightly differently as your choice is arbitrary. It serves for the storyline, I suppose, and there are levels where you do need to use both characters. The music is gorgeous, too. Everything about this game is overflowing with charm. Like a lot of these types of games, there's also a level editor, but the nice thing about this one is you can save your levels by way of a password. Asmic really excelled themselves in all aspects of Catrap. Genuinely brilliant. They should have made these little kittens their mascot instead of Boomer. A hallmark of an excellent puzzler is when simple rules are used in creative ways to become challenging. You're never left trying to figure out how the game works, and are only stumped by your own mental capacity. I've played this for hours at a time, which is unusual for me. Couple the gameplay with the rewind feature, the achievement of which I cannot stress enough giving the limited memory capacity of the Game Boy, and Catrap deserves a little niche in video game history. Shame on us if we ever forget about it. Amidst a plethora of one-dimensional games, we're occasionally graced with a cartridge so full of ambition and variation that they can be tough to allocate to a certain genre bracket. 
Cosmo Tank is part shooter, part adventure RPG, part dungeon crawler, part shoot 'em up. I really don't know what to call this. Ambitiousness on this level doesn't always work, and when I write one dimensional, I certainly don't mean it disparagingly. Nevertheless, when it does work, what occurs are often some of the most memorable and treasured games in any library. I hardly think Cosmo Tank is memorable or treasured in many people's minds. This certainly wasn't reflected in the sales of the game, and it received mixed reviews both now and in 1990. You control an armoured tank tasked with destroying alien life cores to free hostages and rescue planets from the grasp of the evil master insect. There are five planets to traverse. After the opening stage, you can choose the order in which you tackle them. Strangely, the difficulty level doesn't change that much between worlds, so it doesn't matter which order you pick. You start outside in a barren, rocky desert, and are quickly accosted by wave after wave of one-hit kill enemies. These occasionally drop bombs, health, or power-ups. Spend some time killing these early on, as each one gives you a small amount of experience points. You need 100 XP to level up. Although you can only do so six times, your strength and health increase each time. The enemies are coming at you so rapidly, and they're easy to kill as long as you don't hang around so you can hit the top level pretty quickly. The power-ups, represented by a P token, need to be collected in groups of 10, and this allows you to upgrade your blaster into a double shot, and then again into a sinusoidal ball that makes it incredibly easy to hit these weaker enemies. Once you get the required upgrade later on, you can charge up your shots too, giving a more powerful blast that makes short work of bosses. Progress through the initial desert areas and you'll invariably reach a cave entrance, where you'll be approached by a giant insect or spider. These are trickier to kill at first, but drop P tokens each time and respawn just as quickly as the other enemies. This makes it very easy to grind, but ultimately feels fruitless because you don't beat the boss. Eventually, you'll just have to try to sneak past it. Recharge your tank shield before entering, and you're presented with the game's second playstyle, a pseudo 3D style labyrinth with a handful of tougher enemies to face. These are easy enough if your levels and weapons are maxed out, but the targeting combat style takes a little while to get used to. It's not that hard to figure out how to dodge their projectiles. The mazes are not large or complex, which is a good thing because the perspective is disorienting. Turning 90 degrees according to your compass, which you really need to pay attention to, doesn't look like 90 degrees on the screen, it's more like 30, so at first it feels like you need to turn more than you do. Also, the walls aren't drawn right the way up to your HUD, so it appears there are more paths left and right, when really there are very few. Graphically, this part, like the majority of the game, looks pretty impressive, but it takes a while to get your bearings. Just follow the cardinal directions on the compass and you will get to the boss. Here is where the only real disappointment of the game lies. Some of the bosses are dull as dishwater, especially the turrets guarding the energy cores, which never change, firing in straight lines that you have to dodge between. Just keep peppering them with bullets and they'll explode eventually. You need to move your field of vision in order to dodge the bullets. If they don't come at you centrally, then they won't hit you. Once the energy cores and bosses of each planet is destroyed, you can move to the next, rinse and repeat. Between each planet is a short, vertically scrolling shoot 'em up stage. These aren't tricky, but it's a nice addition. Make sure to shoot the asteroids here as they drop bombs each time, which are always handy to have a stock of. You can pick up additions to your tank at various points throughout the game. You don't have to toggle them as in Mega Man, they're permanent. There's a shield unit which allows you to pass certain sections that are otherwise instant death. And on one planet, you'll find you can't progress without acquiring a hover unit that allows you to cross water. There's a sensor unit, which apparently helps you pinpoint the enemy fortresses, but I didn't find it until near the end of the game. Finally, there's the aforementioned pulse unit, which enables you to charge up your laser at level 2 or 3. Very useful. The music fits the atmosphere well, and is competently composed, if a little short on the variation. I would have liked different tracks for each planet. The sound effects are great all round. Cosmo Tank is a very creative and ambitious game which will take some getting used to. Mixed reception it may have had, but I personally implore you to give it its due time. It's reminiscent of the excellent The Guardian Legend on the NES, with a similar theme as well as many comparable gameplay elements, and about that level of difficulty. Sadly, this never saw a European release because I would have adored it as a child. I'll have to be content with adoring it now, and frankly, I'm okay with that.
Sometimes, no fancy titles are needed. When tasked with naming a game featuring three card games, you'd be hard-pressed to simplify it any easier than card game. Heck, they didn't even pluralize it. You can play poker, standard five-card stud rules. You can also play blackjack with literally no frills attached, it's just blackjack. The third game is called USA Page One, which is one of those round table card discarding games, where you can place a card of the same value or suit of the one on top of the pile. Think Uno, this is basically that. Certain cards alternate the order of play, others change the suit in play, some force the next guy to pick more cards up. There are a bunch of different ones. Before you're down to your last card, you have to call it. It took me a while to figure out how to call page one. I would play my second to last card only to have a miss called on me. You need to hold select before you play it, else you'll be forced to pick up two more cards. You get given 100 coins to gamble with for each game, but they don't carry over. In fact, once you've selected a game, the only way back to the main menu is to reset the console, and your score isn't saved, not even by a password. This isn't like one of those casino titles where you can mull about playing various games, accruing more and more money. This is probably the most Spartan game since Shanghai. Literally the barest of bones were provided here, nothing more. There is, however, a fourth option called Fortune. Here, you're dealt five pairs of cards by a fortune teller, from the numbers of which he somehow gleans everything about your future. Your health, wealth, how many rice balls you can eat, how many pencils you're gonna own, and the colour of your shirt. Yo, I know this is nonsense. I'm not even wearing a shirt. The Game Boy quickly found its niche in the video game universe with single-screen games, and many were pretty great affairs. Dexterity is another of these, whereby the game is solid because they were reasonably easy to pull off on the system. The trick was making them at least a little original. You control a flat-capped fellow in an 8x7 grid, with the aim of flipping over all the tiles to the darker side, while avoiding enemies Qbert style. The enemies don't really chase you. If they have any aggressive AI, it's not apparent. They just toddle around, occasionally turning tiles back over. Similar to Othello, you can turn over a whole line of tiles, both horizontally and vertically, if there is a flipped over tile at the other end. Doing this while an enemy is between the two will trip up the alien, leaving it motionless and harmless for a few seconds. They'll eventually right themselves and be dangerous straight away, but fortunately they blink and make a siren sound just before this happens, so you can be prepared. Some levels have pushable blocks that can be used to squash enemies, and while they do respawn, they're out of your way for a considerably longer period than if you just flip them, and can often drop bonuses like extra points, or a really cool pickup that clears out all the enemies on the screen. It's definitely worth using these blocks as a priority. The first few enemies you'll encounter are slow and reasonably easy to avoid, and they don't flip tiles too often. Later on, they get faster and more annoying in their jobs worth ways. Some can jump to avoid your attacks, some can push blocks back at you, and some can dig holes in the ground, permanently blocking your path. Basically, the enemies are there to troll you. You can clear out one whole side of the screen, only for an enemy to flip over one tile and make you rush back over there. 
There's a time limit, which is generous at first, but soon puts the pressure on. You don't start with many lives, but others can be picked up, and if you die on a stage, you pick up where you fell. You don't have to replay the whole thing. It's always nice when that happens. Every four stages gives a bonus level, which is a simple tile memorization game, with tons of points to be had. It's a shame there's no password save, as later on the levels get pretty tricky, and if you lose all of your lives in quick succession, you won't get to continue. It's beneficial with titles like this to be able to practice levels time and again. Yes, enemy movement is kind of random, but placement is not, and it would be nice to be able to develop strategies. There's a very cool multi-mode as well, where you have a cross layout of five screens to complete in one go. This is much tougher, and the time limit will undoubtedly come into play a lot more, but it's an excellent step up in difficulty for more accomplished players. The sound effects aren't particularly prominent, but what's there is done well, and the jaunty background tune is unobtrusive. The graphics are pretty plain, sure, but it's not meant to be a fancy game. I didn't expect to enjoy this all that much, but it's quite captivating and gets pretty frantic at times. You're presented with a simple set of rules that have an ever-increasing complexity of tactics. Give it a go if you fancy a unique, fast-paced little action game. Say to me the words Japanese exclusive shoot 'em up, and I'll bring up at least three games before I mention Zoid's Densetsu, and there's a good reason for that. I would never sully the good names of Sagaya or Chikyu Kaho Gunzas by putting them in the same conversation as this drivel. If you're wondering why you've seen that name before, Densetsu simply means legend, so you might recognize it from a Zelda game, which are called Zelda no Densetsu in Japan or maybe even the Game Boy Castlevanias, apart from Castlevania Legends, strangely, which were all called Dracula Densetsu. I now realize just how many quality titles I've sullied by mentioning them in this review. Anyway, the other part of the title, Zoids, are one of Tomy's range of toys, manga, and video games based on these giant mechanized animals. They frequently were things like dinosaurs, insects, and so on. The game features one of these mechs in a horizontally scrolling shoot 'em up side with the Empire or the Republic. It only changes the graphics of the bosses you fight, nothing more. You at first have a simple beam shot, which can be upgraded to a double or triple shot by collecting W tokens. Get hit once and you drop down, however, and tokens are few and far between, so expect to be firing that single shot a lot of the time. You also get a sub-weapon that differs depending on which mech you are. Some of these are more useful than others, one character nukes everything on screen, which is useful in a pinch, but then there's this mortar shot that basically misses everything. These are equally rare, and frustratingly, you can't use them against the bosses. I have no idea why this would be, but basically don't worry about saving them up. Three lives per continue, and unlimited continues. However, for each death, you go back to the start of the level. Your HP can increase to six, and if you die, you come back as a different mech. The gameplay is unforgiving, but not brutal, and at least you get a health bar. The hit detection is by no means generous, all it takes is for you to clip something by the tiniest hair, and you'll take damage. The biggest issue is the complete absence of anything resembling variation. Every level's background looks the same, there's just more crap in your way. The boss fights don't even have a background, taking place in a pure white void. The enemies are basically identical for all eight levels, again, there's just more of them. Some enemies do nothing but fly in the opposite direction, but some fire these impossible to dodge homing shots that spin around you infinitely until they hit you. Zoid's Densetsu is a really lazy piece of work. It's like a demo version that just loops. The graphics are straight up boring, the music might as well not exist. 
It was released on the Virtual Console in 2011 for some reason, giving you a whole new set of consoles to completely ignore it on. We got there already, it seems. The Game Boy's first self-sequel, that is, the first game that is a sequel to an earlier Game Boy game. Nowadays, of course, annual reiterations of basically the same title are commonplace, with the likes of FIFA and Call of Duty banging out rehashes of worn old formulas over and over again. But to have two titles in the same franchise, in the time it takes to gestate a human? Not so usual in 1990. The first rendition of Boxel was a pleasant, if rather simple, single-screen puzzle game where you push crates around a warehouse onto specific tiles. Boxel 2 is, by all accounts, exactly the same fare. Little else there is to say about it, except if you somehow manage to beat the mammoth amount of levels in the original by this point without losing your mind, it was a simple task for Atelier Double to cash in and release a ton more. There's nothing wrong with that. It is just that, though, a cash-in. Apart from new music, it's still pretty minging, and an odd bit about an alien, it's the exact same game. It's like getting a new crossword every day in your newspaper. They're not going to change a winning formula, but it must take a certain fixation on a routine on your part to go back to it. Good for a commute or a lunch break, but not much else. So, for what may well be one of the shortest reviews in this whole book, we have Boxel 2. The original was a success and sold pretty well. The sequel was not produced in vast quantities, however, and as a result is considerably more expensive than its predecessor. That doesn't matter, because unless you're a completionist, you don't need this one. Ports of games that were downgraded to the monochrome limitations of the Game Boy were very hit and miss. Some, like say Battletoads, worked really well. Others, such as Pac-Man, really didn't. Often it was more sensible for developers to take beloved characters, maybe storylines and settings, and create a different game altogether. We saw how this can work with Gargoyle's Quest, for example. Barai Fighter Deluxe is one of those sadly uncommon examples where an NES title is shrunk down to 160 by 144 pixels and is just as damn good. The game is, aside from the colour obviously, very similar to the original in image, sound and, most importantly, playability. They did a very good job porting this to this level, which is a relief because Barai Fighter was an excellent NES game and it would have been a shame to mess it up. It's a side-scrolling shoot-em-up that also occasionally moves vertically and backtracks. You control not a ship, but a fighter in a mech suit, not dissimilar to Samus Aran or the guy from Turrican, who can shoot in eight directions with a multitude of weapons. The controls are actually really clever once you get used to them. You aim using the D-pad and fire using B, but by holding down the B button you lock in that direction, meaning you can shoot in any direction while moving around independently. And this is necessary as the screen scrolls in all sorts of directions, and enemies can hide in crevices that would be unreachable if you couldn't shoot diagonally, for example. As you move around, not all of the course is visible at any one time. Moving to the extremities and hugging walls – you don't die if you touch walls, thankfully – can often trigger the scrolling to take an alternative path, with nice hidden power-ups like extra lives and damaging orbitals. Bear in mind, however, that the scrolling doesn't stop if you drift down a dead end, you'll just get crushed. 
there are five stages which progress nicely. Each one is between 5 and 10 minutes long, with increasing difficulty and some pretty tricky bosses. Like many tough 8-bit shooters, it's a one-hit kill, but this just makes you get good quicker, and I personally wouldn't change this. The game never feels cheap or unfair, and the controls are really responsive, making dodging accurate. There are three skill levels, complete the hard one, and you unlock a super hard one, but there's not a great deal of difference. The easy mode is still pretty hard, you won't beat this one straight away. Extra lives are plentiful though, you can rack up three or four on the first stage. The three weapons are well varied. You can power up each one ten times by collecting tokens, and they have separate collections, meaning if you die you only lose the power-ups of the weapon that was equipped when you died. The other two remain at the level you've collected, so it's not as if you're completely stranded with nothing. There are rings, which can pass through obstacles and when maxed out fire a deadly spread shot. There are missiles, which you really do need to level up to become useful, as the bullets are pretty small, making it hard to hit things. Finally, there is a laser weapon, which fires in a cross pattern when at full power. All of the weapons have their places in the game where they're most useful. The bosses look pretty great, and like all other enemies are faithful to the NES game. The final boss, the dragon from the front cover, is a slight letdown though, as its attacks are pretty avoidable and really don't vary. It's a complete bullet sponge too, but when you kill it it's very satisfying. The music is exactly how you'd hope. The excellent soundtrack by Norio Nakagata has been delightfully transposed to the Game Boy, and its sound chip does a brilliant job recreating it. The accompanying sound effects fit the atmosphere wonderfully. I've played Burai Fighter Deluxe a lot in my time, so much so that it's one of the few games I can recall beating on the hardest difficulty. It's worth persevering to do, if for nothing else than to see the chicken that comes out telling you, you have earned my respect. Mad, but marvellous. No, not the archaic musketeer tactic. Volley Fire is a somewhat unique one-on-one -on -one shooter where you control a spaceship which moves from side to side firing lasers at an opponent, while trying to dodge ever-increasing volumes of space junk. It feels not dissimilar to Space Invaders, although here instead of a swarm of enemies you have a single target who follows the same rule set as you do. Movement is limited to that one horizontal axis for both you and your opponent, and anything that you can use to your advantage, so too can the other guy. You can push certain debris into the enemy firing line, but so can they, and you can block enemy fire by simply shooting at the projectiles. You garner power-ups from shooting other randomly appearing enemies. These include shields and weapon upgrades. The measly starting weapon can be upgraded, but only slightly, and you lose it if you die. This becomes a problem eventually, as your health doesn't regenerate between stages. Each duel takes place over a first to three kills encounter, and after every three rounds there are boss fights, which consist of a multi-part bullet sponge that, while not difficult, take ages to knock down. 
sometimes levels scroll vertically towards you, but you're still restricted to horizontal movement. As you progress, more obstacles crop up. You'll have to contend with respawning space mines, other firing enemies, mirrors that reflect your fire back at you, and these rather intrusive monolith things that come up behind you and smash into the back of your ship. The difficulty curve is about right, but the main challenge is these obstacles. The enemies and bosses themselves don't threaten you a great deal, particularly because their AI is as dumb as a housebreak. So often, it seems that they're not even firing at you, or making any attempt to shoot around the obstacles. The only thing that will get you hit is your own over-exuberance, or rather, impatience. It's a hard thing to avoid due to the tedium that accompanies the waiting for that opportune moment. So tempting it is to spam the fire button until something hits, that all notions of elegance or skill are abandoned, leaving behind a somewhat redundant and unfulfilling experience. What could have been an inventive and clever little throwback to the early 80s is heavily marred by a rather amateurish quality of programming. The graphics are brash and obvious with no real backgrounds, and the hit detection is all wrong. The soundtrack and effects seem to be rushed together almost as an afterthought, as it's very generic and damn repetitive. Maybe the whole thing was thrown together too quickly. It's a shame, because at the outset, Toei clearly intended to release an original property rather than a rehash of an older game, and as such, they have to be commended for the spark, if not the execution. Sometimes a game comes along that there's really not much to say about, and Pipe Dream definitely falls into that category. This is a decent version of a decent game. The idea of the game is akin to Bloodier, and follows the same sort of concept started by Konami's Locomotion. There's a leaking tap of some sort, and you play the part of a plumber, not that one, who, rather than try to stem the flow of water, decides to build ever more complex and unnecessary conduits through which the water can travel. You have a 7x10 grid, with one of the tiles being the starting point, and you're given a series of curved and straight pipe sections that you must assemble in order to guide the flow through a specified number of spaces. Anything above that number counts as a bonus, with points taken off for placed pieces that weren't part of the course. You have to place every piece you're given, too. There's no skipping. The difficulty curve is well thought out, with passwords being given every five levels, accompanied by some rather rudimentary animations. New features are gradually introduced as you progress. The thing I actually kind of like about this game, that usually I wouldn't be keen on, is the single chance you're given. If you fail to meet the quota on any one stage, that's it, game over. Obviously, you can restart from the most recent password, but your score will not be continued with you, you start at zero again. The tile order is random, so it's a different challenge each time. In the same way that you need those particular pieces to drop for you in Tetris, so it is here. Graphically, Pipe Dream isn't particularly pleasant to look at, and audibly it's kind of painful. However, the gameplay is pretty good for what it is. I can see this being fun for a little while, you know? That's all we ask for at the end of the day, right?
Upon first glance, you might think this is another Shanghai-esque Mahjong Solitaire. I'm here to tell you, you couldn't be more wrong. This is Mahjong Solitaire with a border around it. The basic rules apply, with one major change. Rather than having to see the entirety of a vertical side to make a legitimate pair, now you have to be able to draw a line between the two tiles while taking no more than two turns. See? Totally different thing. Facetiousness aside, the border is actually important to the gameplay. It acts as a ring of overturned tiles that you can plot your connecting lines through. Once a pair is made, these tiles are also overturned, which gives access to other ones deeper in. There is a normal mode, whereby you plough through the puzzles at your leisure. There is a timer, but it doesn't run out or anything. You get five hints per level, and each tile you turn over gives you ten points. It starts pretty simple. You'd have to go some to fail the earlier levels, but there are fifty in total, and by the end even the border of overturned pieces is in play, meaning you're going to have to start with the tiles that are adjacent to each other. The stages get pretty tricky, and the curve is well planned. Also, there's a challenge mode, where you choose a difficulty level of 1 to 5, then proceed through as many rounds as you can to a time limit. The levels here are not the same as the predetermined ones in normal mode, they seem to be somewhat random. There are two tunes in the game depending on which mode you're playing. Normal has a chirpy, upbeat song, whereas the tenser, more challenging mode has some funereal, sombre music. I can't help but feel like they're the wrong way round, but they're both nice songs nonetheless. I can't decide if I prefer this style, or the traditional style of Mahjong Solitaire, the one where they're all stacked on top of each other in the shape of a turtle or something. Hey, I kinda dig both of them. That one is obviously called Shanghai Solitaire, named for the Chinese city. I think Shisenshu comes from the Chinese province Sichuan, so there you go. It turns out, these aren't really traditional games anyway. Most of them came about with the advent of the personal computer. The more you know, right? No 80s console would be complete without a version of Technos's classic street-crawling beat-em-up Double Dragon. Slightly more complex than a lot of Game Boy titles up to this point, nevertheless it's a concept that should be doable on the two-button layout. It should be possible to emulate how it was done on the NES in terms of controls, and largely that's what we have here. The thing that hits you straight away is the sluggish speed of the game, Double Dragon was never known for having the frantic pace of a Ninja Gaiden, for example, with Billy and Jimmy almost cautiously trotting along with their dukes up. However, the Game Boy version is even slower than usual, right down to the music on the first stage. The majority of the soundtrack is very nicely modelled on the NES title, but for some reason this first stage, while well composed, is about 20 beats per minute slower than it should be. The whole level feels like you're walking through some kind of floaty dream sequence. The level layouts are not based off any other version as far as I can make out, and the level up system is not there. You have all of your moves straight from the start. But the overall themes are all there, with the familiar story progression that we're used to. The series did occasionally have a nagging habit of putting some real nasty platforming bits in places, but apart from a couple of instances, this one's fair. There is a part on stage 3 with some moving platforms that you cannot just walk onto like it seems you can you'll have to jump across them. This requires the screen to scroll with you, and it appears that it doesn't quite work properly. You seem to get pushed back, causing you to miss the platform entirely. It's cheap, but learnable, and can be put down to inadequate testing rather than developer trolling. Another example of garbage platforming comes right before the final boss. There are what appears to be drawers, a line of about six that open and close apparently randomly, pushing you back and doing a ton of damage. I've studied it, and I don't think there's a pattern. 
Given the sluggish rate at which the controls respond, there's absolutely no way to avoid the draws if they decide to pop out, meaning you have to take a run and jump and hope the total wipeout stagehands behind the wall don't decide to smack you one. Graphically, the game is done pretty well, although obviously hindered by the smaller screen. Hey, there's a lot to cram in, and the sprites are scaled well. Any larger, and visibility would be limited. But then, everyone moves so slowly, I don't think response time would be an issue. There are only a handful of bad guys, one of whom looks just like Bret Hart, which is really interesting because your character looks like a mulleted Shawn Michaels, providing a rivalry predating their WWF animosity by a good five years. Most enemies are easy to beat, and there are never more than two on screen, so you're rarely swamped. This all changes once a Bobo comes for you. These are completely brutal, and I've yet to figure out a surefire method to beating them. Sometimes they decimate you without giving you a chance to fight back. This leads me to the game's biggest flaw, and it's something that almost made me hate the Game Boy version. When you die, you don't respawn where you fell like every other Double Dragon game. No, no, you have to restart the entire level, meaning you have to tackle the whole stage, complete with a Bobo's bullshit platform sections and bosses on one life. That's just too hard. In fact, it's Double Dragon 3 hard. Double Dragon could have been really good, but it's let down by a lethargic pace, scrolling that doesn't always work, and a really unfair death policy. Instead of trying to rush this trilogy onto the Game Boy, there's a sequel this same year, would you believe? More time should have been taken ironing out the dodgy bits. The hype surrounding the series didn't go away for ages, it wouldn't have hurt to wait. I don't dislike the game by any means, but it's really gutting that the first entry in this franchise is not the classic it should have been. It's been queried before, I know, but how did Mario go from plumber slash white knight to a fully fledged GP in the space of one year? I'd love to know what back alley med school he attended because they obviously didn't teach him much. The premise of this game is to eliminate a predetermined layout of coloured viruses using like coloured pills or segments thereof. These fall from the ceiling and are in two halves. Each half is one of three colours that match the viruses, leading to six possible configurations of capsule. The aim is to align, horizontally or vertically, four of the same colour, with some of those being the virus. These will then disappear. Once all the viruses are off the screen, the level's over. The game gets faster and more difficult as you go on, and the biggest scores come from chains of clearances, but there's little else to say about it. So, you could say this is a Tetris ripoff, which it kind of is, but it lies closer to a game like Columns, albeit an inferior version of that. Something noteworthy about Dr. Mario is that it marks the first time that a video game was simultaneously released on more than one platform. There had been ports previously, of course, but the NES and Game Boy versions of Dr. Mario both surfaced on the same day. I would suggest, however, that the NES version is the one to go for. 
The lack of colours makes using your peripheral vision very difficult, a very useful skill to have in games like these. But more than that, the shading they did use on the Game Boy version suffers from a glaring mistake, and an uncharacteristic one by Nintendo's high standards. In the NES game, the viruses are blue, yellow and red. Obviously that's not possible here, so they used black, white and one of the two shades of grey, right? Well, no actually, for the in-between colour, they actually used light grey for the pills and dark grey for the virus. How this happened, I'll never know, it can't have been intentional, surely. And it's really noticeable when you play the game on a Super Game Boy or a Game Boy Color. Once you colorize the palette, the grey pill is a different color entirely to the virus. You can train your eye to see past this, of course, but why should you have to? Something else I should mention that I'm not a fan of. You know in Mario Kart, when you're in the lead, the game will seemingly victimize you by giving the good weapons to the guys in the rear? Well, a similar thing happens here. If you're doing well and clearing out a lot of mess, the game will actually throw you pieces that you can't use. This was a bad choice. The everlasting appeal of a game like Tetris is the complete reliability on your own skills and the random factor of the pieces that were next to fall. Putting a mechanic like this in the game nullifies both of these points, making for a game that's more frustrating than gripping. Hey, a lot of people love Dr. Mario and who's to argue with them? People enjoy what they enjoy, but when you have Tetris, I'm not sure of the appeal of this one. People often note the excellent music as well, but I don't really hear it. It's good, but it's a little too truncated and staccato for my taste. The whole title just isn't for me. Dr. Mario is certainly not bad. I would go as far to say it's good, but you can definitely play much better titles. I've worked in healthcare, pharmacy specifically, in the past, and it was our obligation to call to task any doctor who simply threw pills at ailments and hoped that they got better. Mario is a terrible doctor. I'm still waiting on the true sequel, the one where Dr. Mario's irresponsible prescribing habits have inevitably led to deadly strains of antibiotic-resistant superbacteria that mutated and kidnapped Princess Peach. Damn it all, Mario, did you take no advice from the World Health Organization at all? An apple a day and bed rest and all that? Quality control at Nintendo HQ was usually solid, but every now and then, someone comes into work stoned, and hence we get things like this. Never before now on the Game Boy has the official Nintendo seal of quality been so misapplied. The game is allegedly based on a Japanese straight-to-TV family drama about a boy and his father who travel to Tasmania in order to find some rare tiger. Why this was chosen, I have no idea, as the game is basically the worst version of Mappy that you ever played. Besides the fact that the film has no noticeable relevance to the game in any way, the film itself never saw a Western release. You're this really awfully drawn little boy that looks like this portrait I have on my fridge that my four-year-old niece drew of me, with legs that spin around like rotary fans. And I think the aim of the game is to collect all the cacti while trying to avoid these blobs with psychotic grins. There are platforms spread over a single screen that you cannot jump to, but can access via these trampolines that inexplicably break after three bounces, leaving behind an instant death pit. Choose slow or fast, it doesn't matter. Everything moves too quickly for the game to even be playable. Four enemies in one tiny maze, Imagine if the ghosts in Pac-Man were coming at you in a maze about a tenth of the size it usually is, and the only power pellet you have are bombs that explode after you've already been killed. Come into contact with any enemy, and your character falls over and has what can only be described as a seizure. These graphics are close to being the most childlike, amateurish, god-awful mess of pixels I've ever seen. You'd expect this level of crap from some unlicensed knockoff garbage like Cheetah Men or something, but this was licensed by Nintendo. I can't believe that, and furthermore, 
the Tasmania story somehow made it through the too shitty to leave Japan filter that saved Westerners from a lot of the most terrible Game Boy games. The game gets 1 out of 10 for graphics because the intro screen with the running tiger looks quite nice. It's actually understandable that there's no information anywhere as to the developers of this game. Who would own up to it? I try to refrain from going off on a game too often, and I don't like to swear in reviews unless I run out of adequate adjectives, but this is like something out of an AVGN episode. What were they thinking? It's so bad. Oh, light help me, it's so bad, I hate it. And I hate those stupid Tasmanian tigers too. Why is it called a tiger if it's a marsupial? I'm glad they're all dead. I hope you're making notes on all these new anime and manga we're discovering on this journey, because there will be a test. Seriously, there have been a lot of them, and I must admit, when I find a game based on a manga, I tend to declare it as such and leave it there. Hey, anime isn't really my thing, and I don't care to make it my thing. Ranma One Half is a manga that started in the 80s, where the main gimmick is this teenage boy called Ranma, who turns into a girl when splashed with cold water, only to change back into a boy when splashed with hot water. Bizarre as this may seem, it was actually a massively progressive property back then, as Ranma could use the pros of each gender to his or her advantage. The series revolves heavily around the intricate personal relationships that surround Ranma and his, her, betrothed Akane. Story's too deep to go into here. Anyway, it's not relevant to this game. Here, you gotta rescue the girl, man. So much for progression, eh? The game immediately feels like SD Lupin the Third, being a free-roaming, top-down puzzler with bad guys dawdling around trying to catch you while you sort out this or that. And there's a good reason for the similarity. The developers and publishers are the same. Where Lupin the Third was a plug-in title in nothing but name, Ranma One Half at least takes the gimmick that the show is known for and made a game revolving around it. Each level presents you with an open arena with lots of boxes and enemies walking around. You can push blocks and open crates in a similar manner to The Adventures of Lolo. You typically start off as male Ranma and, as in the show, can turn into the girl by finding a cold water receptacle or having one thrown at you, and finding a kettle or some such thing will reverse the change. The aim of each level is to find three of Akane's possessions – hats, gloves, that sort of thing – at which point she'll burst out of thin air and run towards the player. Catching her ends the level. Switching gender is not merely a cosmetic effect or a stitched-in fan service; it actually features pretty heavily in the puzzle-solving aspect of the game. When boy Ranma, any block that gets pushed will travel in that direction until it hits something. As girl Ranma, blocks are pushed one space at a time much more precisely. You'll need to use both skills at various moments to get through these stages. If you can't find the necessary kettle or bucket, wait around and Ranma's dad, in his cursed panda form – yeah, this show is mental – will throw one at you, akin to how he would hurl Ranma into ponds or squirt him with hoses in the show. This feels a little like the Japanese exclusive version of Popeye, although not nearly as randomised as that one. The levels here feel much more thought out, with deliberate puzzle solving necessary to progress. The blocks I mentioned are all movable. In Sokoban style, you can push them, but not pull them. Some can be destroyed, others have to be paired with like blocks to get rid of them. You can crush enemies against walls using the blocks, a la Battle Bull. This first Ranma One Half game, of which the Game Boy actually has three, all very different, takes inspiration from all over the place and manages to streamline it all into an experience that is somehow not a total mess. It's not superb by any means, but compared to many of the anime slash manga tie-ins we've had so far, it's a damn sight more playable than usual.
Thank <laughs> you.